Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when I feel like it o'clock, and I sure feel like it today. It's uh, I'm my I'm Pearl Wisdom, as everybody knows, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom, as everybody knows, and everybody should know. And this is the reason why I feel like it a lot today. This is Delhi. This guy is amazing writer for the Anaheim Ducks and many other things. He has podcasts coming up that I'm really excited about, and uh, he reached out. to he wanted to talk about something I hadn't even got into. Actually, I hadn't even really wrapped my mind around all that much. And there's a lot of talk about uh, change of divisions and stuff like that. But first of all, Deli, thanks for coming. And how, how's everything going there in uh, your your world? Everything's good. We uh, here in the United States, we're kind of <laughs> just waiting for uh, the stuff around the election to clear up, which could take a few months. But uh, hockey. Feels like it's kind of taking a back seat, but with COVID getting worse pretty much around the nation, you you, you got to figure out what the NHL is going to do uh, to play because obviously you want them uh, as hockey fans, we all want them to have a season. So uh, I think that's why it's pretty pretty interesting to talk about real alignment and the divisions and, and the way they're going to proceed. So I'm I'm excited. Um, yeah, with the way the NHL took care of the playoffs, I bet you they're going to do a bang-up job here. So you have uh, put a lot of thought into this, so I'm going to let you fly, buddy. What are, you, what are you looking at? What do you think this alignment may look like? Well, I think most of us probably agree that, that they're not going to do really a, a bubble like they did in the playoffs with just two hubs and then all the teams kind of cycling in and out. And um, I looked at the – there was a, uh, a poll done by the N- uh, athletic NHL staff with players – and it was something like 60, almost 62% of players said they'd be willing to play in a bubble for half the season or less. But more importantly, 32, um, over 32% of players said not at all. So uh, that's a significant amount of the league that doesn't want to be in a bubble, doesn't want to be away from their family, even, a, I mean, a little bit more than the average NHL season. So uh, I think that's number one. they they got to figure out some sort of hybrid. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and then that's two. I, I think eight. They said 80% almost of players said they'd be comfortable playing in front of fans. Uh, and I think that's, I mean, obviously, being a player, you want, you want that uh, motivation and the, and, the, and the stadium atmosphere. But you have to remember, they also know where they're getting paid and where that money comes from. So uh, they, definitely, they definitely don't want to risk any of their, uh, their contract and, and that type of thing going forward with, uh, with the decrease in revenue from COVID. So that's, those are some interesting points. But I think the most interesting thing is the realignment of the divisions. Like that's going to be uh, a number of factors playing in on that. Um, I read a, a, an article on ESPN today where it mentioned um, Gary Bettman, of course, talking about the restrictions crossing from the United States to Canada. You can't really do that uh, if you want to play if you want to play hockey. Uh, so there's probably going to be an all Canadian division, but they still have to figure out what the hub cities are going to be, both in Canada and, and around the United States. And, how much traveling they're going to do. That, to me, is the most interesting, especially, I mean, starting off in Canada with uh, how kind of how spread out everything is, but also packed together. Like in the western part of Canada, you've got Calgary and Edmonton and then Vancouver, and they're not they're not very far away from each other, relatively speaking. On the east side, you've got Ottawa, Toronto, and Montreal. They're also pretty close together, even closer than those western cities. But then you've got Winnipeg, just like on an island alone. Like what? It almost, it um, with the exception of uh, Winnipeg not being a place where anybody wants to spend a lot of time. No offense, Winnipeg. Uh, that would almost be a perfect hub city because it's right in the middle of everything, yet so far away uh, and isolated. But I, uh, just to try to keep things a little warmer. And this is this is all speculation on my part. No, no reporting, but in because the, the weather's a little warmer there, temperate there because of the ocean, and people can spend more time outside. You don't have to be indoors all the time, which kind of increases your risk, uh, the COVID risk. Um, and then the and the east east coast, I mean, all three of those cities are bone chilling cold in the winter. Uh, so you're wondering. Uh, who's going to be, if they're going to do a hub there or let the teams play. This is going to be very interesting to see how the Canadian division plays out. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think one of the things that they both have come, they have come to the realization of or, you know, admitted. uh, Gary Bettman said, uh, I did hear him say that 
they if they do a hub, it'll only be for like a certain amount of days, and then you go back home again, a certain amount of days, and you go back home again. If they're going to do something like that, uh, where the hub would be now would be really anybody's guess. I I'm thinking again they would probably go back to where where the way it was before with the cities with the least amount of problems you know like kobe cases like the edmonton edmonton again we're still very low or toronto they've, they've just shut down oh, winnipeg, wow. winnipeg just shut down again they're in the red so winnipeg probably wouldn't be an option although i understand from travel perspective that that would work but and also you got to look at amenities too i think edmonton is more is a little bigger than winnipeg and there's just a few more amenities available to take care of uh, players like that. So I think Edmonton would probably be the one. But then when you get into the United States now, that's a whole new can of beans. Uh, how, how are they going to, like you'd have to figure Boston, Detroit, you know, uh, Buffalo, all the New York teams in one area. You know what I mean? Like all that one little area there. Yeah. Yeah, there was a a very interesting article. Uh, I think it was in the Athletic, reported by Michael Michael Russo, that the that Anaheim had put a strong push forward to be a hub city. And if you think about it, I mean they're pretty they're I mean they're pretty a pretty good example. You're in a warm weather area, so you don't have to spend a lot of time inside. And the Ducks have a great new practice rinks. It's got twenty five hundred capacity in their practice rink. So if you did want fans back, and you somehow needed to manage two games at once and you couldn't get you couldn't get uh the the the, the anaheim arena to uh like you know, the honda center to like host two games in rapid succession although they definitely could you could probably do an overflow game in uh the duck specific practice rink in in five points arena which is in irvine uh they could stay teams could stay there a whole bunch of hotels but i think the sneaky thing that 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 wasn't mentioned the ducks don't share uh their arena with an nba team and so I think that's an extra wrinkle that's going to be thrown into a lot of play in the United States and in Toronto specifically, where you have to share arenas most of the, in most cases with an NBA team who's also looking for some sort of solution for their uh, to have a season. So that adds an extra wrinkle. I think that's why Anaheim, Anaheim might have an advantage, uh, and and then places maybe like Pittsburgh, where there's no NBA team in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's up there, kind of a little more centrally located, both for teams like Detroit, Columbus. Uh, and then the East Coast team. So that, that's interesting to me. But uh, the, I wonder if the NHL is going gonna, is gonna to try to, if they are doing hubs or a few hub cities where, where kind of the, the, the teams close to those hubs will play, I wonder if they're going to try to do most of them in warm weather areas. So that would be like L.A., Anaheim, and then maybe Tampa or Miami, um, and maybe Dallas, Nashville, even D.C. I mean, D.C. has cold winters. They get snowstorms, but... The, not all the time. Like DC is a little more of a temperate kind of area. So uh, I think all those places could potentially be hub cities. And uh, I would think from a health standpoint, you don't want somewhere where you're going to be want to shut, want to be shut inside all day. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. Now, Florida. Now, of course, Miami, Tampa, like that would uh, be, uh, they would be using that for the heat, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's so, a little more. They're a little separate for. Uh, oh, let's see. Tampa doesn't have. Uh, Tampa doesn't share a, a, a rink. I don't think with a basketball okay. team, but Miami. Does. Uh maybe they don't. I don't. Uh, maybe I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but Tampa definitely doesn't. Oh, okay. Well, that would be something that they could use for sure. They they could go that direction as well. Um, as far as uh, how this would all look, and from a hockey perspective. That's going to be pretty exciting. Like where all the how the the competition now it changes completely. Like I get from it the Canadian division, from what I understand, is pretty much a for sure. That's mm -hmm. pretty much going to happen. Uh, they are uh, the NHL has been one to really take caution compared to the other leagues. I don't think they're going to be looking at having fans right away for sure and all of that. Um, so I, I've heard that the, the Canadian division is almost a for sure. So looking at that, that's kind of exciting in a lot of ways for, especially Toronto, Montreal is going to play more, uh, mm -hmm. Calgary, Edmonton's going to play more, 
uh, just all of them in general. Like there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, angst amongst Canadians. People don't realize <laughs> that. Like we like Canadian teams, but we don't like each other until we have to. <laughs> and uh, so that Vancouver Edmonton is fantastic. So that I think there's going to be a lot of rivalry stuff happen if we do it this way, which is actually in the end, in, in from a hockey standpoint, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Specifically, the increased Calgary Edmonton factor and the and the Toronto Montreal factor, and, and just generally the competition. I mean, you mentioned before we were talking, the only team really that is it is not competitive in Canada as of now is the Senators, and I think they're they've gotten better. Montreal has gotten much better. So I think in general, you're going to have a very a very competitive division when you the Canadian division. Maybe no team that's an outright contender for a cup. We'll see how Edmonton looks this year, and and calgary and vancouver but and, and toronto but i don't think as of now you you think of any of those teams as like they're good they're like far and away in the top tier but they're all they're all competitive it all could happen for them so it's going to be uh it's going to be a good division and then i wonder about the other divisions in the united states i think the pacific division whatever hybrid or or west southwest division that that's going to be it might be pretty weak it's going to be aided probably by vegas Colorado, and dallas um, I don't see I don't see Anaheim or LA, even though LA is getting better, and Anaheim we hope is getting better. I don't see either of those teams really getting up to the level of your Dallas, your Colorado, your Vegas, uh, your Vegas team. So that's going to be a little bit interesting. And then uh, I wonder, I really wonder just geographically how they're going to figure out the Northeast and Central divisions because uh, you could really have a pool of death uh, in the Northeast if you wanted to. I mean. I was just looking at it without, again, any inside information, but maybe where hubs could be located. If you had something like uh, maybe in Nashville, if you had a, if you had a hub in Nashville and you had teams like St. Louis, just looking at proximity, St. Louis, Nashville, maybe Carolina, Tampa situation, Florida, Washington, that could be uh, a very competitive uh, division. And then if you had something in the Northeast, maybe in Pittsburgh, have maybe Rangers, Rangers, uh, Flyers, Sabers, Devils, uh, Penguins division. That would also be <laughs> that one would be pretty intense. So um, I think this realignment has the potential to to make some more exciting hockey. Maybe breed some new rivalries, revive some old ones. I would love to see Boston and New York, uh, the Rangers, play a lot more. So I, I think that I hope that there's going to be significant crossover uh, between the Atlantic and Metropolitan divisions. Yeah, as you mentioned that, uh, I feel I like I really feel for like Ottawa and Detroit because I think yeah. <laughs> Detroit. Oh my gosh, you already had a bad enough, and now you're going to be in that division. Oh my, <laughs> <laughs> that would be getting just getting crushed daily. Uh, and Ottawa as well with the because everybody pretty all the Amer all the Canadian teams pretty much improved over the. And Ottawa did to a certain extent, but I mean, if you look at those lineups, I just can't see them ha having much of a chance at all in that. Uh, which would, I guess, be good for them because they're really rebuilding, so they want that top draft pick. Well, that's one way to get yeah. Canadian division for Ottawa in there. And I think I think it would be interesting to see uh, how. I mean, some of these divisions and, and realignments aren't totally. Uh, out of out of question. If you look at the old Southeast Division before they they went to Metropolitan Atlantic, I mean that was Carolina, Washington. I think Washington, Tampa, Florida, like and the Thrashers while they were still there. That was a pretty crappy division for most of the part. But those teams have all played in the same division together within the last decade. So uh, yeah, it's not totally out of the question. And and, and you think about proximity wise, how close a Nashville is and uh to to those southern states i think it's not it's it's not totally out of the question dallas is another question mark where where they would end up dallas minnesota they're kind of on an island by themselves so it makes it harder but I, I, i'm excited to see where they go with it yeah i it's gonna make things very very interesting where would minnesota yeah i don't know but see it's a if they do go the bubble it really just matters which way, wherever they're closest to as to where they put each bubble, right? Mm -hmm. I think Minnesota would probably closer to Pittsburgh if they were to go, like, say, Pittsburgh or something like that. So they'd end up being there. And then, uh, like you said, if, if they go Anaheim, then I I think Dallas would be closer to Anaheim in that case, right? So that would be they would go over that way. 
And uh, so it would kind of go from there. And then how they're all playing out of the same one. So how you configure it really doesn't matter, except unless they have a contingency plan that if things open up, they can go back to their arenas again. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think they have to look at that from that perspective, too. If things open up and if there can be fans and you can be sure uh, you can be assured that owners will be looking at that because they want to open those buildings. Every buildings, again, let's face it, uh, forget about the fact that from a financial perspective, just from a enjoyment of the game perspective, that, uh, you know, we want that. So however it's going to be done, we'll have to, I think would have to be with that in mind as well, that when mm -hmm. things go back, then you're going to have fans, so you want to have the divisions in uh, a kind of a proximity basis that it makes Excuse sense me, if that ever were to happen again. Um, travel costs a lot of money, and that's the reason why these divisions are made the way they are. I, you know, I would I would love to have it just stay kind of like this or something like this, or because I, I don't know, <clears throat> couldn't you make up for the money in travel basically having more rivalry games like wouldn't that give you more money from tv rights and stuff like that apparently not so travel must cost a ton for some yeah. teams i would and have I've, to think i mean the tv deals are are decided beforehand and i think they're just trying to renegotiate with so maybe maybe it would save them some some money on the back end but uh the other thing i mean the last thing at least in the united states that i think is still a question mark is the political climate i, I know this isn't cnn or msnbc but uh, if the season is going to start in January, you have the the presidential inauguration. Basically, the United States switches presidents January 20th, and their policies are going to be pretty different. And you don't know whether Biden is going to leave, still leave a lot of the decisions up to the states, uh, take des decisions out of their hands in terms of travel and, and COVID-19 restrictions. And so I think they, there's still a big question mark there that uh, that needs to be answered before the NHL can really uh, really go forward with planning to have fans. I know that they have to go forward before the season to start before, but uh, you got to think they might start on the very conservative side of things in terms of, of having fans and not having fans and traveling and then hope that, uh, that things improve as the year goes on. Well, from a Canadian perspective... Uh, you can be rest assured. They, we are very cautious, and uh, we we rely heavily on generally with our political landscape. We re rely heavily on science and what our medical people are saying and stuff like that here. So, um, yeah. Um, so you can be assured that uh, our our prime minister, Mr. Trudeau, would be saying no way are we crossing borders or anything like that. So the Canadian division is almost a for sure. So if we're going to go that way then really we have very, I don't think the NHL in general has very little choice but to go uh, the way that we're talking about as far as on the American side as well. I think hub cities are almost guaranteed uh, mm -hmm. that uh, some sort of hub cities. It's just that, um, like I said, you said that you, you brought up the fact that there was a, uh, uh, they asked the players, you know, you said 37% said that they wouldn't do the hub at all. Is that what you said? 30, 32 said they would not would not play in a bubble, and so not play in uh, a bubble. Yeah. So basically, that's I mean that's why they do hub cities. You you do a hub city so you can control it more and create at least some form of a bubble. And I mean, as we saw in Major League Baseball and the NFL, not doing hub cities really did cause a spike in in COVID cases amongst players. I mean, you had the NHL doing their bubble, thirty three thousand ish tests, no positive no positive results. Same with the NBA. Uh, meanwhile. Major League Baseball and the NFL, their their players are getting catching COVID on a weekly basis, and to whole teams are getting sick. Back when the Phillies and Marlins had that thing in the in the summer, you have to have some sort of bubble in order for there to be safe uh, safe procedures for for the players. So I think that's really not I think that's not a not having a bubble is in any way, shape, or form is definitely probably out of the question for the NHL. Yeah, I for sure there's some form of a bubble. Um, like I said, one week in, go home for a couple of days, whatever the case may be, and I hope I would hope that players would be happy. I mean, sure, there's a lot of players that don't need the money. 
it's not really a financial thing. Um, uh, I think most pre most players would would like to do well for the sport and for their fellow people, fellow players who don't make that kind of money. Like a lot of people are like, yeah, I want 700 G, dude. I'll be bubble all you want. You can put me in bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there Every, all day long, you know. Everybody's playing in this little like circular <laughs> they call dorbs. <laughs> the little like circular old, bouncy ball. The video game thing, the, the old uh, not video game but uh, hockey game where they yeah. have a bubble and you used to play like that. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> they bubble actually hockey. put a literal. Yeah, it's called bubble hockey. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember what that was. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> bubble hockey literally bubble hockey i'm sure there's plenty of players new players coming up who don't especially for developing players they can't sit for that long you got to get out there and develop and this is their careers we're talking about and i think most of the players out there who are there also take that into consideration that their fellow players there are fellow players out there whose career really relies on being able to play the game and progress and become better and stuff like that so their immediate reaction might be i won't do it but i think when it came down to crunch time that would start to slip a little more a little bit so yeah. I, I think that nhl has a little more leeway in things that they can do than what maybe the immediate statistics would say can happen for sure but uh i think the nhl did a fantastic job for the playoffs and uh probably better than any other league out there honestly uh would you agree with that yeah yeah for sure i mean the nba uh rivaled it i will <laughs> uh I, I will say that the i think if you ask the players i think they would wish they had a little more uh nba style bubble where they got their their some of their families got to come in and uh eventually they got to see people I, I remember i think it was espn that released that that kind of um inside the bubble update where players yeah. anonymously told them how they felt about things and i know that was one of the sticking points that that they were told that their families might be able to come visit and that never happened and uh so i think that i think that both leagues did a great job but the nba the nfl i mean blech, the nhl did do a great job they finished their season nobody got crowned a champion so what more can they, and they and we had we had like football sunday style hockey for like a month where it was like four three or four games a day that was awesome i, I can't complain about that so great job in the nhl's part definitely yeah i watched a divorce worthy level of hockey i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> <Mad> Hawk. <laughs> that was it was awesome, but I don't think I could keep that up. My gosh, uh, you know, how do you hold up a family? But it was incredible. And um, I'm like a little side note here. I, I'm I've been a Gary Bettman supporter for quite some time. I think he's done a heck of a job, and uh, I'm glad he, get, he. Hopefully, he's getting a little props for how much he worked with all the owners and the players and everything to have that all working in his staff and the people that they did there because it really was fantastic. And and what I love about um, hockey in general and the owners as well they seem to be able to think things outside of the box they don't uh, just stick they're very they seem to be a little more open-minded than the other leagues and are willing to follow suit that might have something to do with the fact that we're the smallest market in all the professional sports so we have more uh, maybe motivation to open our our minds and make sure and you see this opportunity that we can bring in a fan base when everything else is kind of going to heck out there uh, so i don't know how much credit i can give to that i, I give them a pat on the back and kind of <laughs> yeah yeah at the same time like uh, a realistic uh view of it is that hockey has an opportunity to be huge here now and uh especially for teams like you follow and like i said Check out uh, Delhi's writing. All he he is an excellent writer. Um, with the Anaheim Ducks, they certainly need to be out there and, and see uh, people get to see that team and what, what it's doing and the fact that it's there. Um, also, Delhi, I wanted to get before we get out here. I wanted to again talk about that fantastic podcast you're working on. That I Absolutely. hope I uh, I can't wait to be part of it. Possible that. It, yeah, we have uh, so a good update about that. I actually finished editing the the fourth episode uh, last night, so I've got a good collection. I'm going to start releasing them. Episode one, I'm hoping uh, tonight or tomorrow I'm going to release. I'll send you the link. I've got to got to figure out um, the best way to have get it up on Apple Podcasts and all those. But it'll be called the Lost Teams Podcast. 
Uh, you can look for it probably starting tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, episode one will be out there. And then, yeah, soon we'll, we'll, we'll have you on there, Perlo, to talk about some... Uh, Talk about a, a, a an old WHA or NHL franchise that has disappeared or moved, and the effect that it's had on on today's game. Yeah, it's exciting. This is he's talking about like defunct teams from all sports, and uh, that and like how they became defunct and how it affected the league and where they went and all the stories that happened in that. And there are some fantastic stories. I, I've read up some great stuff on. How the team name was and how they got that and some of the ways some of the ways the team name changed and all of that uh yeah. and it's it's pretty it's, cool the first episode is going to be uh covering my friend andrew is going to be covering the pittsburgh pipers who were an aba basketball team uh that changed like you said changed names like three times and, and for funny reasons uh and i will be covering the los angeles blades which is the first professional hockey team from southern california that uh i'm just going to tease it had a massive kind of indirect effect on uh, one of the bigger sports franchises in all professional sports here in Los Angeles. So uh, yeah. look out for that. And then the one we just recorded was about, um, we covered, uh, Andrew covered the Minneapolis Millers, which is a minor league baseball team up there in Minneapolis that has a long history of, of very good players. And I, I did uh, the... Uh, uh, an old baseball team, professional baseball team in the 1910s who only but are the reason that Major League Baseball basically is exempt from antitrust laws. So uh, pretty interesting wow. story there. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, for Deli, for coming on. I'm Ben Powell from B Powell Picks. If you go out there right now, we're making tons of money. It's absolutely free until hockey season starts, doing tennis and uh football we are hitting at about 75 percent so we want everybody to make money show how great we are there go to b pal picks on the patreon have a great day everybody lots of love to ya